Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear and other random stuff. In this video, I'll be repairing a Macintosh PowerBook 165 laptop from about 1993. This is one of several Apple laptops that were built with a similar case design and share many of the same parts. Not surprisingly, almost 30 years after they were made, they share many of the same age-related failures, and therefore, many of the same challenges when attempting to resuscitate, upgrade, or improve the performance of one of these machines. By no means am I trying to discourage anyone from attempting to resurrect a vintage computer, quite the opposite. But you should be prepared for potentially opening yourself to a time-consuming can of worms. There's often the need to obtain assemblies that are no longer available. These assemblies were intended to be replaced and not repaired. It may be tempting to source a donor machine as a source of parts, but it's likely that it too will have the same issues. Here are some common problem areas that you should expect that you might have to deal with. The main battery and or the internal PRAM battery not holding a charge, leaking, swelling, or corroding. Deterioration of the plastic leading to discoloration or cracking and literally falling to pieces. Failure of the hard drive to spin up or boot even though it has a bootable system folder. The trackball failing to move the pointer, or the pointer moving in a jerky or uneven motion. Issues with how the LCD display looks. Let's talk about the main battery first. The battery for this machine is nickel cadmium, and if it is leaking, consider it a toxic material. The battery is removed by sliding the battery door open, that's forward, and then sliding the battery out. It would normally come out easily. In my case, it wouldn't come out at all because it was swollen. I was able to pry it gently to get it to come out. There was no damage. But if there is corrosion, use vinegar and swabs and later distilled water. You'll notice that the keyboard keycaps have yellowed. I've read that the Retrobrite treatment works on this kind of plastic, though I haven't tried it myself. Here's a link to a video on the Retrobrite process. The pointing device on this computer is called a trackball, which is like a mechanical mouse turned upside down. They tend to collect an amalgam of skin grease and dirt, which gums up the mechanism. First take out the ring, then take out the trackball itself. There are two blue idler rollers that connect to the optical assemblies, and there are three idler balls. All need to be cleaned with IPA, and if necessary, use a screwdriver or toothpick to remove the gunk. Once they've been cleaned, don't forget to wipe the ball itself, as that is the source of much of the dirt. Let's power up the machine. That requires plugging in the adapter and pushing the on button. You should see the Happy Mac icon, but more than likely, you'll see the disk question mark instead. The disk question mark means that the hard drive is not bootable for some reason. Most likely, if the machine hasn't been used in 20 years, but had been working before, it's because the hard disk spindle is seized. While you can attempt to source another drive, functional 2.5 inch SCSI hard drives are few and far between. You can replace it with a modern solid state device, such as a blue SCSI, or try what I did because I figured I had nothing to lose when this hard drive refused to spin up. Pretend this wooden block is my hand and the workbench is the underside of the power book. After I did that two or three times, the hard drive worked. It is very satisfying, but please, attempt at your own risk. Here we go again with the hard drive working and the Happy Mac appearing. You may have to adjust the contrast and the brightness to get a decent picture. This is where you may notice the next problem. The image is ghosted or shimmery, or the brightness or contrast change randomly by themselves. This is related to a problem on the LCD display board caused by capacitors that are past their best before date. Repairing this is not for the faint of heart, and as you will see later on in the video, did not go as expected for me. So get out your Torx 8 and your Torx 10 screwdrivers. It's time to take it apart. 
With the battery out and the adapter disconnected, remove the screws on the bottom. There's also a Torx screw at the back right there underneath the telephone connector. There are claws that hold the case together, so you want to release the claws, you don't want to break the claws. No, not that one. The two pieces will separate and the interconnect may come out by itself or you may have to help it out. The interconnect fits in this socket. The PRAM battery is located next to the speaker. It's on a small board which can't come out until you first take out the backlight inverter board. It should be removed before it has a chance to leak. And if it's already leaking, treat it as toxic materials. Start by disconnecting the three flex cables. This is done by opening the connectors. Then you can take out the screws that hold in the backlight inverter board. You can cut out the old battery or desolder it, your choice. You can reinstall the battery board and backlight inverter board for now. The next step in getting access to the display is removing the bezel, which is held on by two hidden screws. Take off the screw covers and remove the screws. Lift up the bottom of the bezel and then use a small screwdriver to release the two claws, one on the left and one on the right. No, not that kind either. And that reveals the display, but we're not there yet. Disconnect the backlight cable. Remove the four Torx 8 screws from the corners. And then this is now ready to come out. Be careful because it's still connected with its flex cable. Open the foil shield and lay the display down on the keyboard. And then disconnect the flex cable by opening the connector as you did before. You are going to be removing the flex cable. It's held on by double-sided sticky tape. I've marked the cable with a magic marker and marked the display with a magic marker. Here's the display on its face and we have to get to the printed circuit board which is underneath this plastic. We are boldly going where no Apple technician has gone before. Remove the three screws that hold the cover in for the extremely fragile fluorescent tube. Then use a pair of pliers to straighten out the 10 metal tabs and finish by taking off the frame. The 11 metal cans you see are the polymer electrolytic capacitors that need to be replaced. If you're lucky, they haven't leaked. If you're not so lucky, you need to remove the old electrolyte before putting in the new capacitors. It is not recommended that you use hot air to desolder these components because first you could cause the capacitors to pop and second you could damage the LCD display. So you're going to be doing it with a regular soldering iron, albeit a very small one. I'm not going to be using polymer electrolytics like the originals were. Instead, I'm going to be using tantalum capacitors, which should last longer. I've had to turn the temperature on my soldering iron up quite a bit to about 475. Notice the polarity, positives on the left here. The new capacitors must be installed that way. I'm going to put a little bit of solder on each of those pads and then put the capacitors into place. There you have it. Polymer electrolytics replaced with tantalum capacitors. It's intermission time. Time to visit our concession stand. Who's been eating my capacitors? asked Mama Bear. Who's been eating my capacitors and eating it all up? cried Baby Bear. Who's been sitting in my chair? Papa Bear howled. It's showtime! Things were going way too smoothly. What has happened is the standoffs that were embedded in the plastic there and there, which attach to these hinges, has failed. Since the plastic is brittle, the hinge literally ripped the anchor out of the housing, so nothing is holding it together now. This is not unexpected, but I didn't expect it to happen to me. But the plot thickens. When the plastic failed, 
the display moved and caused the ribbon cable to get pinched by the hinge, and that ripped the display cable. That gave me the opportunity to use some words which are still not permitted on TV. Since these display cables are not available, I have no choice but to fix it. Flex cables can be fixed, but it's usually done under a microscope. You'll see that in the next video. And then I'll finish putting this PowerBook 165 back together. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving me a thumbs up and subscribing to Mr. Brown's Basement for more interesting and unusual videos.